company in. I appreciate you all coming in and spending a little time with me this morning. Um, as we go along, if there's anything that I go past too quick and want me to back up or explain something or try to explain something a little better, just raise a hand and holler at me and let me know. And feel free to ask questions as we go along. I got to. I guess studying, maybe, I don't know if that's the right word or not, but uh, one thing I really enjoy doing when I'm not gardening is, is reading about gardening. And over the last few years, uh, one of the things I really enjoyed reading is different philosophies. I got really into organic gardening here several years ago and uh, uh, got really interested in reading about the organic movement and, and some of the people that were the early founders and practitioners of organic gardening and just what some of their ways of, of thought were, what some of their, their kind of core beliefs about how you should garden and that kind of thing was real interesting to me. And um, I don't know that I've really seen this term used uh, much out there. I, I kind of was thinking of a way to describe uh, this kind of approach or system and I thought, well, it's kind of a minimalist approach. And what I kind of want to talk to you, um, talk with you about today is um, sort of two approaches to minimalism. One being minimal inputs, and we'll talk more about that. And also minimal effort. Um, I found early on, you know, you start gardening and you start learning and you read all this stuff and you, you, know, you ask people and it's almost like gardeners hit a peak where you realize you're trying to do too much. You know, you got too much going on. And, you know, sometimes, which is what we want to potentially want to eliminate, you know, sometimes gardeners get so much going on and eventually they just get frustrated and quit, you know. And we don't want that to happen. We definitely, you know, I'd like to see everybody in the world have a garden of some kind. So, you know, how do we make gardening as easy as possible, as simple? possible because you know the more you enjoy something the more you're going to do it you know the better time you're going to have the more positive benefits you're going to get out of it so that's kind of my goal today is to talk a little bit about some of that stuff and uh, hopefully maybe you'll pick up a tip or two that, that might work for you and help you out um, there's my email if you want to make a note of that. I enjoy conversing with gardeners. If you ever want to, you know, shoot me something and say, hey Mark, have you seen this? Or ask me a question about something that was in this presentation. If you want to get a PDF of these slides, you can email me and say, hey, send me a, a PDF and I'll send you a copy of the slides. So, you know, feel free to reach out to me anytime if you need to or want to. Now there's my opinion right from the start. I think all home gardens should be organic gardens. Not everybody agrees with that. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But that's my opinion. Now why do I say that? In my opinion, I think organic gardening is the easiest gardening that you can do. And I hope to show you some tips uh, today that will kind of reinforce that. For me, it's a very carefree type of garden. Now, what do I mean by that? One thing that I really enjoy about my garden is being able to go out, walk through the garden. You know, if I see a, a pretty little cherry tomato or something there that tempts me, it's just being able to pluck that right off the plant and pop it into my mouth. And since I garden organically, I never have to worry about how many days ago did I spray that? You know, you don't have to keep up with spray intervals and all the different things that you might have to do if you're out there spraying pesticides. You know, you read the pesticide label and it tells you how long you stay away from it or how long before you can eat it and all that kind of thing. Where if you're not using those products, you know, that's one thing that you've taken off your plate right from the start. So again, it's just for me a very carefree way of gardening, a lot of peace of mind, because there's never never that thought in the back of my mind, ooh, I wonder if this has still got a bunch of residue to go. I wonder if I should be eating this or not. I know my stuff's clean because there's nothing on it to start with. 
it can be a very economical way of gardening because you're not buying a lot of inputs and things to throw into your garden. And it can be a very healthy way of gardening, both for the environment, uh, because you're not putting pesticides and chemicals into the environment, and also, of course, for yourself and for your family, because you're not putting those pesticides and chemicals you know, into your shed. So there's a few reasons I think it's a good way to go. Now, is everything always going to work out in your organic garden? No. You're going to have things that will fail. You know, maybe have a pest issue every now and again. Are things always going to work out in a chemical garden that you're spraying chemicals and pesticides and things like that? No. You're going to have failures in a chemical or conventional garden as well. I think an important concept is this one, or kind of my way of saying this, is just keep planting. Keep putting plants in the ground. Keep sowing seed. You know, everything's not going to work out. But if you just keep planting, keep sowing, keep planting, keep sowing, you know, just as this wise gentleman said, he said, the failure of one thing is going to be repaired by the success of another. So just, you know, realize that. Not everything's going to work out, no matter how you go. But, you know, keep things going and you'll have many successes to repair or replace anything that failed. Very wise man said that, Mr. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. He was one of the most uh, influential and successful gardeners of his time, in addition to all his other accomplishments. So let's look for a second about minimizing input. Start out with what is today called conventional gardening that's typically really reliant on inputs. You're going to be uh, you know, purchasing chemical fertilizers to get your fertility to grow your plants. You're also typically going to be using chemical and synthetic pesticides to control pests. So again, you're reliant on those inputs. You need those fertilizers for your fertility. You know, have an outbreak of pests, you're going to come out there and spray it. So, probably the next step to that, or the, or the you know, response to that, is what I would call level one organic. This you might see, or an example might be like a transitional garden, or maybe somebody that started out conventional garden and would say, well, you know, I'm going to try this organic thing. So basically what you're doing in this is you're taking the same sort of techniques that you used in conventional gardening and you're substituting them. You know, nowadays you can go online or you can go to OMRI or some of these organic um, institutes and they'll give you list of materials that are approved for organic gardening. So, you know, instead of going out and buying a chemical fertilizer, you look for an organic approved substitute. Instead of going out and buying a chemical or synthetic pesticide, you look for a, a, a material that's approved for organic garden. So you're kind of taking that same mental approach, you know, still applying fertilizer, still spraying a pesticide if you need to. You're just substituting organic materials for chemical materials. Now, you can take that a step further, or what some people might call deep organic. Um, you also might get into deep organic systems like permaculture, biodynamics, things like that that you'll hear about, where you start to focus more on the system, the garden itself, and whether it can take care of or feed or nurture itself. So, you know, you hear people talk about sustainable gardening and sustainable farming these days. That's kind of the core definition of being sustainable. Can the farm or the garden support itself? So you're not having to get all these inputs and put into it. So instead of being so reliant on fertilizers, feeding the plants, you'll become more reliant on feeding the soil 
taking care of your garden soil or farm soil and let that rich soil feed the plants. That's kind of the best way I can describe it. So instead of packaged fertilizers, you'll concentrate more on compost that you can make on site uh, and other organic matter that you can add to the garden. We'll talk about some few other ideas on ways to do that. And instead of uh, spraying pesticides, whether they be chemical or organic, you focus more on creating a balanced ecosystem in your garden or on your farm so that the pest control is taken care of by itself. Uh, theoretically, you're growing healthier plants out of a healthier soil, so they're more resistant to pests and diseases to start with. And if you do have a pest come along, hopefully you, you know, by going to this system of, of a more holistic approach, then you've got maybe birds, beneficial insects, things like that that come on the scene and essentially take care of your pest control for you. Uh, that's kind of uh, a paragraph and there's a book by Elliot Coleman, which is kind of a famous organic gardener called New Organic Grower. And he kind of sums that up by saying, I've always found pesticides, whether they be organic or chemical, to be the wrong answer. Uh, the systems of the natural world are very logical and the idea of striving to create life-giving food while simultaneously dousing them with deadly poison is illogical. So you get to that concept of, well, what if I just don't use any pesticides at all? You know, what if I make the garden a holistic entity that kind of supports itself and doesn't really have pest issues because it's so darn healthy you know, it, it kind of keeps pests at bay. You see that same kind of philosophy uh, or discussion, uh, you know, in human health care too. It's like, you know, how many uh, drugs and treatments and things and, and hospital visits could we eliminate, you know, to make ourselves healthier and more resistant to those diseases to start with, you know, so it's kind of a corollary on that discussion there. So that's, you know, that's kind of a major concept and something that's, you know, it's, it's really totally opposite to the way some people think. It really shocks some people when they first kind of see that idea of, you know, what if I just don't spray? You know, that can be very foreign to some people. So that's something to consider and, you know, think about all the effort it takes to go and get buy a pesticide, read the label, mix it, spray it, clean the tank out when you're done, you know, dispose of that stuff when it's, you know, out of date or you've got some left that you're not using. So, you know, by, again, you can minimize your effort by just, you know, setting that stuff aside and not using it at all. So again, back to feeding your soil. How do you feed the soil? Again, I kind of alluded that already. If you want to put organic matter into the soil, some of the common ways to do that, uh, again, you can make compost, you can use mulches. Now, mulch is another one of the material uh, words that means different things to different people. So let me take a minute to explain what I mean when I say mulch. I don't mean go to the garden center and buy a bag landscape mulch and start spreading that on your garden. That's you know what a lot of people think when you say mulch is going to get the bag of mulch and, and you know that stuff's mostly pine bark and pine chips and things like that. And that's typically not what you want to put in your garden. For the typical garden, um, and again, if you go back to that sustainable concept, trying to you know keep the system closed there. Things that might be available to your grass clippings, like a great mulch, leaves, shredded up, chopped up leaves that you might collect in the fall. Um, you, know, you can bag leaves in the fall, just pick them up dry, put them in a garbage bag, and uh, you know, stick them off in the garage or under the porch or somewhere. You know, they'll keep forever, and you can pull those out in midsummer when you need them and mulch with them. So, you know, bank some leaves when you have a chance in the fall, if you have a chance. Um, you know, another term when you see mulch used, um, and of course, some home gardeners do this concept too, but especially uh, 
you know, in, in bigger farm operations, an example is a strawberry culture, a thing that's real popular now. Is they'll come in and cover a whole row with plastic sheet, you know, usually about three feet wide or so, and then they'll pop the strawberry plants uh, through spots in that plastic. They're using that plastic for weed control. And they call that mulch too. And I've always felt like there should be a different term for that. It should just be called barriering or something. When I think of mulch, I think of organic material. So again, that's kind of a dangerous word because people use mulch basically for anything that covers the ground. You can come in and throw down a carpet ring and some people call that mulch. You know? So again, I'm talking about using organic material and what you're doing by mulching with those organic materials, eventually they're going to break down and decompose, and a lot of that will end up in your yard and soil for you. So again, feeding that soil with organic matter. Uh, cover crops, or what some people call green manures, if you have a, a garden bed that's uh, you know not going to be used for a little while, a good example is over the fall and the winter. You know, a lot of times people will shut down a garden bed and not really grow something over the winter. You know, you might come in there and, and sow, you know, some cereal rye or some Austrian peas. Uh, you can go online and, and research different cover crops for the fall and winter season. Uh, you know, grow a crop in that bed just for the specific purpose of generating more organic matter. Um, and sometimes I'll grow garden crops kind of as a dual purpose uh, like one thing i really like to try to grow in the fall time is peas uh, i love peas you know shell peas or snap peas either one and it can be kind of iffy whether you're going to harvest them or not depending on the weather because if it stays real real hot you know on into the fall a lot of times your peas just won't produce or won't, won't do good but a lot of times I'll sow them anyway just to take that chance because they're easy enough to sow. And you know, hey, if they work out great, if they don't, they don't. But typically you'll get enough growth out of them that even if you don't get a decent crop of peas you can harvest, you know, you kind of created a cover crop. You've grown a, a legume that puts nitrogen into the soil. So, you know, don't be afraid to grow garden crops as a cover crop too. It doesn't have to be you know, something specifically that you look on a list that says these are cover crops. You know, basically anything that you want to grow can be a, a cover and can add organic matter to your garden. And another one that's popular, and I'm going to kind of show you a hybrid technique of this here in a minute, is what a lot of people call lasagna gardens. I know some of you might be familiar with that term, and some may not. Uh, they took to the term lasagna garden because it's a, it's a garden bed that they build in layers. They put different layers of material like you layer a lasagna in a pan. And uh, this is a no-till approach. That's a term that you hear a lot these days where you're not having to come in there and plow or till. What they do is just take cardboard or newspaper and just lay it right on top of the ground. Whatever grass and vegetation, weeds, whatever you got there, you won't have to worry about hoeing it up, tilling it up, plowing it up, or anything. Just lay a big, big layer of cardboard or newspaper right on top of it to chunk it out. And then they'll build the garden with just organic matter and, and you know, hopefully things that you maybe have around your property that you can get for free. It looks like here they purchased a bale of straw to go on top, which is fine. But uh, you know, in this example, it looks like maybe they've come in with a, a bucket of compost or maybe some manure that they got out of the, the chicken coop or something and put on top of the cardboard and then a layer of grass, a layer of leaves, a layer of grass and topped it off with a layer of straw. Of course, that would cover that entire bed that way with each layer. They just kind of you know, stacked it out there so you can see each layer. But that's what they call a lasagna garden bed. And, so again, there's kind of a, a minimal approach in its own sense in that you don't need tools to do it. You don't have to wait for, you know, the farmer that comes every year and plows people's gardens around town. You don't have to call him up. You don't have to go out and buy a rotary tiller and, and get out there and do that for a while. You know, you just come in, throw material down, and then start gardening again. So again, there's a way to not only add organic matter, but also, you know,
can't be seen as a minimalist type approach as well. As a gardener, homeowner, really anybody, you know, if you can, recycle all your available organic matter. Don't send it off to landfill where it does nobody no good. Organic matter is a valuable thing if you're going to be gardening and growing food. So, you know, make yourself a compost bin if you can. Uh, if you're in a situation where you can't do that, put a worm bin in your house. That's something you can do indoors, right under the kitchen sink if you want to. Let those worms make compost for you. Uh, you can research that. It's called vermicompost. If you go on our the extension website and just search vermicompost, you can pull up information on that. And this helps you use like steel rods and poke holes in the compost and let the air get inside. Does that help fit? It can. Um, he asked about getting air in the compost, and yeah, that is an important thing. Kind of what that picture might indicate, the pitchfork there, some people just take and turn the compost periodically to kind of fluff it back up and put air in it. I've seen people kind of what you talked about with the rods and stuff. I've seen people, if they've got like a whole bunch of material and you're going to make a big pile or, or fill a big bin like that all at once, you might take and put some posts, maybe three or four posts standing up and fill that material all around it. And then after the material's kind of decomposed and settled some, you can go in and pull those posts out and it'll leave like air shafts down in the compost pile like that. So there's different ways you can do that. Uh, you know, if you happen to have any livestock, you know, chickens, rabbits, goats, and you can all look to the cows and horses, you know, obviously they can make a lot of organic material for you with their manures, you know, kitchen scraps, like I say, if, if you get into that and, and really start, you know, working with organic matter in your garden, and after a while, you kind of start to see organic matter everywhere, you know. It, it, it kind of becomes a lifestyle of, of recycling those things and, and not throwing them out. And that's something that's real beneficial. So again, just to kind of summarize that, that concept of soil health, Feed that soil with that good organic matter, get it nice and rich and full of life, and it's just going to help everybody. You know, you'll get fertility from it, the soil's going to hold more water, so you won't have the waters off, you won't have drought issues. Uh, it's going to be just a healthier ecosystem and environment to grow your plants. So let's talk a little bit about technique some different things, like I say, that you might incorporate to make your garden easier. We already talked about, you know, cutting, cutting down or trying to eliminate all the inputs. Um, but again, you know, if you can make a garden that you can just do with real basic tools, you know, maybe just a, a fork, you might need a fork to occasionally turn something over, you know, maybe trowel and help you do a little digging now and again. Um, Again, if you can make a garden that you don't have to till or plow, you know, you've eliminated a lot of work there. Um, few controls, again, if you're not having to come in and spray stuff and do all that stuff all the time, you know, you've eliminated a lot of work there. And few weeds, there's, there's real simple and easy techniques that you can employ so that your garden and, your, and you do it yourself doesn't get overran with weeds and you know, come August, you just throw in the towel and then let the garden go to the weeds because you're so tired of pulling with it. So let's take a look at a few of those. And this is one of those uh, organic philosophers here, uh, Fukuoka from Japan. He wrote a book called The One Straw Revolution. It's uh, really influential on a lot of organic gardeners. And he kind of sums up sort of the idea that I'm after there. He says, I was aiming at a pleasant, natural way of farming or gardening, which results in making the work easier instead of harder. So again, that's, that's the whole idea. You know, make it an easy, pleasurable experience. He says, when you get right down to it, there are a few agricultural practices that are really necessary. Another thing that he talks a lot about in that book, he was a... Uh, agricultural research scientist and he found that um, 
he became sort of disillusioned or disappointed with the concept of breaking things apart or looking at specific things uh, in research. A lot of times they just take one little element to kind of break it down and research. And that has its point, but he wanted to look at in the whole system. So he basically dropped out of, of ag research and went to farming because he wanted to get on the farm and work with the whole system. And something that he talked a lot about was he found that he started asking himself instead of, well, how about doing this or how about doing that or doing that, every time something came up, he would ask himself, well, how about not doing this? How about not doing that? What could I do different? What could I change that would make the system easier or simpler? So that, that's a good thing to ask yourself when you go into the car. Do I really need to do this? You know, can I just not do it all together, or is there something else I could do that would be simpler or easier? But just to maybe give us a few ways to look at some of these concepts, I just went on and just kind of picked a couple of pictures uh, right off the internet, kind of some, some typical you know garden pictures that I found out there, and uh, I thought that would give us a couple of things to look at here. Okay, nice looking garden there, nice and neat. First off, you look at the size of it, and I would assume this is probably a rototiller garden. You know, it looks like it covers a pretty good area. Uh, you know, the soil looks like it's worked up pretty good, so I'm just going to assume instead of coming in there with a fork or a shovel or whatever, they're probably running through there preparing that with a rototiller, which, I mean, that's fine if that's what you want to do. And I'm going to say that as I go through this. You know, if you have a way of gardening that you like and you enjoy and, you, and works for you, go for it, you know. I don't want to, um, you know, make this come off that I'm saying, oh, you know, my way is the best way or anything like that. It's not. Everybody finds their own way of gardening that works for them. I just want to give you some things to consider that might, you know, give you some ideas to simplify or make things easier. Okay, organic matter. Now this soil in this picture looks very good. It's got a you know, very dark, you know, almost black color to it. It looks like it's got plenty of organic matter in it. However, I want you to reconsider this system of having a row and a path, and a row and a path, and a row and a path, and a row and, and on and on, because Basically, you're doubling the area of land that you've got to work by doing that. So, you know, you're enriching this whole big area of soil, not only where the plant's growing, but in the past too. So that's a whole lot more compost you got to make, a whole lot more organic matter that you got to apply to keep that soil rich. And we're looking for an option besides having that rolling the path kind of style like that. Okay, mulch. There's no mulch here anywhere in sight. There's just bare soil. So they've missed an opportunity to add more organic garden matter to that garden. Also, though, take something like this lettuce crop here that's growing. Every time it rains, you're going to have soil splashing over into that lettuce. So when you go to harvest that, you're going to spend a whole lot more time at the kitchen sink washing some soil particles and stuff out of that lettuce. Where if that ground's mulched real good, it will keep that crop cleaner for you as far as soil splash. So that's kind of something to consider too when it comes to mulching. Compaction. You're going to be having to walk up and down these paths all the time to weed and to harvest and do different garden tasks. So as you do that, you're going to be compacting that soil, driving the air out of it every time you walk up and down through there. Weeds. Anytime you've got open soil, you've got an open invitation to weeds. So again, that kind of goes back to that mulch concept too. So, you know, there you set yourself up with that type of garden and be doing a lot of hoeing, a lot of weed control. Okay, here's another example of kind of typical garden. Now this soil, at least in this picture, doesn't look so great. If you kind of ignore these few spots of grain through here and, and just focus your 
eyes on that soil, you know, it kind of looks like the Sahara Desert or something. It doesn't look like there's a whole lot of, of organic matter in that soil. So I'm going to make the assumption that this is a chemical garden. They're probably doing conventional, come in there and spray and fer uh, you know, not spray it, but spread and fertilizer to get their fertility. Now, I might be wrong. This guy that had this garden may see me sometime and, and beat me up because I said something wasn't accurate about his garden. But that's just I'm making that assumption because that's kind of what it looks like. So. Again, you've got no cover of mulch there. You've got erosion of potential to the maximum there. Every time it rains, every time the wind blows, you've got a chance to be losing what topsoil you've got there, either by runoff or just by the wind carrying it off. And that's something you want to eliminate at all costs is erosion for the garden. Because if you're going to be taking all this time, like we're talking about, um, to you know, get that organic matter and that garden good and rich. You don't want it blowing off and running off down the street, you know, taking all that good soil away from you. Again, a big space, we're talking about big equipment, either coming in there with a tractor every year and every spring and plowing it or getting in there with a rotary tiller and back and forth, up and down, side to side, you know, to get that prepared to plant in. I already talked about kind of organic matter. That soil, kind of just looking at it there, looks like it could really uh, be starving for organic matter. Again, mulch, you don't have any mulch there anywhere in sight. It's gonna cause you to use a lot more water too, because you're gonna have a lot more evaporation out of that soil since it's not gonna be covered with mulch. And temperature's gonna be a factor. In the sun, in the middle of summer, with the blazing heats, you know, beating down on that soil, it's really going to heat it up. It's going to, again, speed up how much moisture is lost from the soil. It may overheat a lot of the plants that you're trying to grow. So you can really help regulate temperature, too, if you're using mulches. So Compaction, again, you're going to have paths in and out through all that stuff. You know, another great opportunity to be compacting the soil there. And again, you're gonna to have to come in with that rototiller to bust all that compaction up. So back to equipment again, you know, a lot of these things feed each other. You know, one thing makes you have to do something else, makes you have to do something else sometimes. Weeds, again, you got that bare soil. You know, any weed seed that comes along or blows in there has just got a great opportunity to, to spring up and grow. So again, you've got a lot more hoeing and stuff to do there. Now the seed, now I like the way you planted is, this looks like uh, tomato plants over here. There might be a pepper or two mixed in there. But you've got kind of a good little block system there and, and stakes for his tomatoes going on. I like the look of that, except there's not any mulch again in there anywhere inside. And now that's a big thing for crops like tomatoes where you have soil-borne diseases that get on your foliage. All those blights and things that start at the bottom of the tomato and, and you plant and work their way up. It's soil-borne organisms that do that. And generally what really contributes to that is every time it rains and hits that bare soil and splashes that soil up on your tomato plant, that really propagates a lot of those diseases. So that's a real important plant to mulch around. You can keep a good mulch around your tomato plants where you don't have that soil splashing up on them. It'll make a world of difference. Now you will, I mean sometimes you just have a tomato plant that's just susceptible to disease. You know, I use it uh, every year. There's like one plant that just, you know, no matter what you do, it's just eat up with disease. I just pull it out of the garden and get rid of it. Sometimes you just have a susceptible plant or susceptible variety. But Overall, if you keep soil from splashing on your tomato plant, there'll be a whole lot healthier. So let's look at an option that you could mitigate or eliminate some of those potential problems in a row garden. Kind of doing, in this example, a hybrid, I'll call it a hybrid version of that lasagna garden bed. Now it's real common, people will take you know, old scrap boards or go buy some cedar or something. A lot of people like to edge these beds with you know, a wood box just to kind of keep it neat and even. You don't have to do that. You can just do it down 
bare ground and just kind of mound up your bed. Um, you could put rocks around it if you have them. You could cut down a tree and you got some good sized branches. You could border it you know, with tree limbs. You could use cinder blocks. You see all kinds of versions uh, that people do to make borders around these garden beds. But again, you can do it with no border at all. And again, that idea of just coming in right on the bare ground, I didn't do anything, uh, you know, <coughs> any kind of till and plowing, I just came right in on top of that grass and slapped that cardboard down just to choke out, you know, the weeds and the grass there. And I wanted to show you, there's all kinds of different, this is kind of a standard a lot of people use. It's four feet wide by eight feet long. You see a lot of people use those four by eight beds. But the beds can really be any shape that you need, any shape that you want. Uh, you'll see some people make gardens, uh, you know, if you have a disability or something where you can't get down on the ground, you'll see them even raise these up, you know, make them like counter high, put them up on legs and things, and build raised gardens and stuff. So there's all kinds of variations, you know, and you can make these to suit your own specific needs like that. I want to show you a quick picture of this one that you just barely see part of off to the side over here is a cold frame. And there's one more pane of glass that goes on this. Those are really, really useful in the early spring and also in the fall when you have frost conditions. You can grow lettuce and spinaches and different things in there. And you can, you know, even when they're forecasting frost, put those window panes over it, you can really extend your garden season. So there's all kinds of beds like that that you can do, old frames and different things. So again, there's a lot of variation, but I'll just show kind of a basic idea. Now what I like to do I'll, uh, when I build these kind of beds, I'll do kind of a lasagna technique and throw in a bunch of organic matter if I've got it laying around, you know, some leaves and grass and different things. But then I also like to just come in and get some soil in there and you know, just get some good soil in there and start gardening in it right away. Uh, the lasagna garden bed that you build just filling it full of organic matter, a lot of times people do those in the fall so that that material has a chance to decompose and break down and then they plant it in the spring. That's one way to do it. Another way uh, that you can do it if you don't have a lot of soil available but you want to start gardening in it right away Go ahead and build it with all the organic matter like we showed earlier. And then, you know, even if you just have to go buy a bag of garden soil at the garden center or whatever, uh, just come in and, and kind of make a hole in that organic material, all the leaves and grass and stuff, and fill that hole with garden soil. And then you can plant it and start planting right away. That's another thing I've seen people do. They won't have to wait on that bed to get ready. So again, a lot of different ways you can approach it. I wanted to show some pictures here because you see, you know, there's cardboard on the ground and all that. And, you know, that's all fine and dandy, but what does it end up being? So, here's one of those four by eight beds. And a lot of times I like to do just a, a mixture of stuff in there. This particular bed uh, has a couple of tomato plants. They're small right now, they're just getting going there. But it has tomato plants on one end and pole beans in the middle, and then it has pepper plants on this back side back here. I like to do that a lot is to put my tomato cages on the ends because then it's really easy to reach all in there and harvest your tomatoes and peppers and stuff. And these beds are also really easy to do structures. A lot of times you can just come in with a piece of wood or a stick or something and just screw it right into that wood. You don't have to be pounding stakes into the ground and things like that a lot of times. But back here I've made trellises for peas if you kind of squinch, you can barely see the little peas shoots starting to come up out of the ground there. And you know, eventually they'll climb those lines there and it'll just be so thick with peas you can't see the, the bottom of the bed there. There's another picture kind of more close up to that. I've got some more pepper plants at the back side here and I just filled this whole front section with peas to climb those trellises there. So a lot of times those kind of beds makes it real easy to do those little trellis projects and different kind of climbing projects like that. Now, I myself, I, I don't live close to Murfreesboro. I don't have access to a, 
the free mulch <laughs> that people live in Murfreesboro have access to over here at the Florence Road Center. So I don't mulch around my beds. I'll just come in and cave and then run, run the lawn mower through there and, and kind of keep that from getting too out of control. But now a lot of people like to come in and, and mulch all that, you know. And, and so again, you can do that to whatever your preference is. Um, here's another bed again with tomatoes on each end, and this is actually a crop of peanuts uh, growing there in the middle of the bed, just another four by eight bed there. Uh, this is that coal frame. I've actually got two of those coal frames. And when you get into the middle of summer, when you don't, you know, you can't really use those lids on there anymore. I take the lids off and it's too hot, you know, by now to grow lettuce in there. This one actually has a little switch charm left in it. But there I've just come in and sowed like some cow peas to, you know, kind of use it as a cover crop and a harvestable crop. You can certainly eat the cow peas too. But, um, so again, you know, sometimes use that in the cold frame, sometimes just use it as a planting bed. This is uh, a bed full of sweet potatoes back here. So again, sometimes the bed may be mixed with all kinds of different stuff in it. Sometimes it may have just one crop in it. Uh, this bed had onions in it. It was just solid onions. And then when those onions came out, well, onions is one crop that's kind of difficult to follow. Some things don't do well after onions. Uh, beans have a decent chance after onions, so I just went ahead and sowed some bush beans in there. And again, I kind of approach that as a cover crop because if, uh, uh, if they do fine, if you get a good harvest of beans off of them, that's fine. Uh, if following those onions, if for some reason they don't perform all that well, well at least you, you put a little helium in there, you've got a little nitrogen in there. You know, you put a little more organic matter in there, you've done something that kind of cleanse the soil a little bit from those onions. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can approach different things that you plant. And not always from the mindset of harvesting, but sometimes just from the mindset of improving the next thing that comes along. You can get, again, all kinds of variations of structures. You know, uh, this is those cattle panels that you can get at the farm supply stores and you can put a bed on either side of that and make kind of a tunnel and anything that likes to climb cucumbers and some melons and pole beans and things like that just love to climb up uh, you know trellises like that and you know I started talking about minimal work minimal effort now obviously you know, it, it takes time, it takes effort to, to get these beds in and get them set and put the soil in them and all that. But once they're done, they're there and they're there for a long time. And so, you know, you have that initial effort up front, obviously, but after that, they're very, very easy to, to take care of and care for. Uh, this is kind of a double length bed that I did. It's sort of hard to tell in this photo, but it's, it's four feet wide. And then instead of being eight feet long, it's 16 feet long. And uh, it's got tomatoes and then okra and then tomatoes and then cucumbers on, on little cage trellises that are climbing. And then eggplant and then more tomatoes. So again, you can get just a, a conglomeration of different things going, you know, and, and of course, obviously put flowers and things. I do have some different flowers and things and so on about my beds, although you don't see it in any particular bed. Um, so again, you know, just a wide variety, just about anything works in these kind of beds. And again, you can see I'm keeping mulch in here. I mean, virtually weed free. You know, occasionally as you're coming through water, you might see something starting to sprout and you just reach down and top it out, but you're never in there hoeing, you know, and, and just doing all that laborious uh, weed work. Very weed free garden. In the fall, uh, any of these beds, if you're just shutting them down, if you're not going to you know, do a cover crop or anything like that, a lot of people just, just shut the beds down and let them be dormant for winter. That's fine too. Just cover it with a mulch. I mean, put six inches or more on there if you've got it. Grass, leaves, 
whatever you got, just cover it with a thick mulch and you won't have any weeds starting there over the winter time. And in the springtime, when it, when it comes time to plant, a lot of that mulch is going to decompose and work its way into the soil, but you would usually have a, you know, a layer left on top. I mean, all you got to do is pull that out of the way and you're ready to plant. You, know, you don't have to, to till, to plow, to hoe, to do anything. Um, so let's go back and kind of review. Um, again, you don't need any heavy equipment to do that kind of garden. It's going to be easier to keep it well fed with organic matter because, because you shrunk the space. If I took you know, the things or the rows that I planted in that four by eight foot bed and spread it out to where I had paths between all of the plants, you know, it would easily take up two or three times the space. So again, you've shrunk that space down. So you're not having to feed and care for as much of an area as you would otherwise. Uh, those, the idea behind these kind of beds, I didn't mention this earlier, is you never step inside. It's completely accessible from all the way around the bed. So there's never any point when you have to step in there, when you have to go in. So again, you don't have any paths in it. Uh, you're not compacting the soil by stepping into it. It keeps that soil loose and fluffy. You're going to keep mulch in there. You know, never try to never have bare soil in there. Now, the exception to that is if you just, you know, sown the seed. There's some seed that you don't want to cover with a big, thick mulch. It might, you know, keep them from germinating. I'll, I'll typically uh, just come in if I'm sowing seed and at least sprinkle just a very, very light fine coating of grass or some really light mulch over just to eliminate soil splash if it happens to rain before those seeds germinate. But that's the one time when you don't really have a lot of mulch on the bed is when you're sowing seed. But again, by having that mulch covered, you're going to eliminate most of your weed problems. You're going to eliminate erosion going to cut down on a whole lot of watering because that mulch is going to help maintain the moisture in the soil. You're going to moderate soil temperature. That, that soil is going to be a little more insulated when the weather's cool, so it stays a little warmer. It's going to be protected from the hot blazing sun in the summertime, so the soil is not going to tend to overheat in the middle of summer. So there's so many benefits from that mulch. You know, disease issues of soil splashing everywhere on the plants and spreading disease are mitigated not only by the mulch but because you've eliminated those paths and you've got a bigger canopy of plant cover. You know, you have less soil splash and erosion and those kind of things. A thing that I really, really love about gardening this way is it's always ready. If you've ever grown garden, you know run into that frustration in the springtime when you can't get into the garden because it's too wet. You know? These kind of gardens, I've come, I couldn't tell you how many times I've went out either the day after it's rained or it's rained that morning and I went out that afternoon and planted something. Because it's sitting there, it's always ready, it's not full of weeds that you have to hoe, you don't have to do any work to the soil. You can come out break the mulch back, scratch the soil with a stick, and drop your seeds in, and you're done. You know? So again, there's just so many things that, that that type of garden makes easy once, once you have it established. You know? there's, there's always some kind of work to be done, but again, there's ways that we can potentially make it easy. Another thing I really like about this style of garden is I call it no pressure garden. Because, here's an example, if you hire somebody and have them come on and, you know, plow up a big 40 by 50 foot, you know, garden for you or whatever, well then once all that soil is worked up, or if you've done it yourself, you know, if you go buy a rotary tiller, well then you got to use it, right? You spend all that money, you got to go out there and, you know, plow you up a big area with that rotary tiller. Well then once you get that big garden area worked up, well gosh 
then you got a plan, right? So then you're right from the start, you know, the weeds are chasing you already because you're trying to get everything planted in that big, huge area before the weeds take over. Here, with this type of gardening technique, you can limit yourself, which is very important. You know, that's one thing that leads to a lot of frustration with gardeners is just trying to do too much. So don't be afraid to limit yourself. You know, start out with a four by four bed, even half this size. Or you know, start out with one four by eight bed and get that one bed going, you know. And if you get to work in that bed and you say, okay, well this is good. You know, I got a lot going on this year. I got to work and I got the kids and I got all this going on. This is all I can handle. You can stop right there and be happy with it, you know. If you get that four by eight or four by four done, and you say, hey, this is going great. Well, now I want to do another. Well, now I want to do another. I've got, I don't know, I've lost count 16 beds or something now in my garden. I'm probably going to add a couple more uh, this fall. But again, it's something you can pace yourself. You, know, you don't have to go in there and be a, put in 20 garden beds at one time. You do one, got that handle, you want another and add another. Got that handle, you want another and add another. At any time, you can stop. You know, so you don't have that pressure on yourself. Oh, man, I need to get out there and hold that huge garden. I need to get out there and plant that huge garden. You keep, you know, keep it limited to that. Uh, this was just to show another uh, option on the size. This was a bed that I eventually planted to blueberries. And before I uh, was ready to transplant the blueberries, I was just really working on getting a lot of organic matter. In this case, for blueberries, a lot of aged wood chips. But uh, a lot of that stuff in the soil, that's just a sunflower crop uh, that I grew uh, kind of in the interim there. So, you know. Again, that idea of just, you know, always be sowing seeds, you know. Something's going to work, something's not going to work. Well, don't worry about it. Just keep sowing, keep planting. Enjoy the things that work for you. You know, the other things, maybe they at least got big enough to contribute a little organic matter to your soil. You know, turn them under or throw them in the compost pile and start something else. You know, don't worry about it. So, just to summarize, um, Think or I hope what I covered there today is you can have a perfectly successful garden without chemicals, without spraying, whether it be even organic approved pesticides. Um, there's only so far, and now I'm not saying I'm far from perfect. <laughs> Believe me, you know, if something came along that the garden didn't control itself or that I couldn't control, I would certainly look for something to help it with. So I don't want to give you that idea of if I'm totally opposed to controlling anything. One thing that I haven't figured out a way to naturally control, and that's cabbage worms. So I do use, that's the one, uh, this whole year, that's been the only thing I've had to use. Uh, is the uh, thermicide, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. You'll see it uh, packaged as a powder called Dipole. But that's an organic approved, and it's, it's a common one a lot of people use. You know, some of the imported pests, cabbage worms, and stuff that was imported on a boat or whatever, sometime it came in on something. And it just doesn't seem to be an effective, natural, you know, native predator for it. So, that's the only thing that I've found to be able to control uh, cabbage worms, which is a little thermicide every now and again. But again, it's not a chemical, it's a biologic, it's approved for organic garden, it's healthy, you know, it's not harmful to humans, it's not harmful to honeybees, all down the line, it's a very safe product. So if you do have to use some, I do want to stress that. Look for the most targeted pesticide, in other words, a lot of pesticides are broad spectrum. They kill anything they touch. So, you know, do your research, you know, find out what the pest is that's giving you a problem. Look for something that targets just that pest, if at all possible. There's a lot of things that's available. Also, be sure and read your labels. Um, 
a lot of uh, pesticides, even organic pesticides included, that are relatively safe are not always safe. You can use them in a manner that's not safe. Just because it says organic, I don't have to mean, oh, hey, I can just spray this willy nilly because it's organic. Now, read the label. Um, check the honeybee statement on there too. That's something that they've added to a lot of products uh, is a honeybee statement. It'll tell you when to apply the product so that it's uh, not harmful or least harmful to honeybees, which is usually early in the morning, late in the evening, because you need honeybees most times during the day. But read the label and see what it says about honeybees, because we want to try to protect our bee and our pollinator population as well. So again, you know, I don't want to, I do want to put that out there that there is at least one control product that I've had to use or I wouldn't have any cabbage otherwise. Uh, you know, I don't want to be a hypocrite, so, but again, for the most part, no chemicals, no spraying, uh, you know, very easy as far as weed control and maintenance.